Hello. Thanks for joining us for Bookbound 2020, a From Home Literary Festival. My name is Tessa McQuatt, and I'm here to host the discussion between authors Monique Rafi and Nika Shukla. This event is being curated in partnership with Wasafiri magazine to raise money for the UK-based mental health charity Mind. Mind provides advice and support to empower people experiencing mental health problems. Their statistics show that on average, one in four people will experience a mental health problem in a typical year, and 2020 certainly is not a typical year. Make your donation to support MIND using the link to the Bookbound Just Giving page displayed below. You can find out more about Bookbound, Wasafiri, MIND, and our authors by visiting our website, bookbound2020.co.uk. And now on to our event. Let me introduce our authors. Nika Shukla is a novelist and screenwriter. He is the author of Coconut Unlimited, which was shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Award, Meet Space, and the critically acclaimed The One Who Wrote Destiny. He is a contributing editor to The Observer magazine and is also the editor of the best-selling essay collection, The Good Immigrant, which won the Reader's Choice at the Books Are My Bags the Books Are My Bag Awards. He's also the co-editor of The Good Immigrant USA with Shimane Suleiman. Monique Rafi is the author of six books, five novels, and a memoir. Her work has been nominated for the Orange Prize, the Costa Fiction Award, the Encore Award, the Orion Award, and has won the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature. She is a lecturer on the MA MFA in Creative Writing at the Manchester Writing School at Manchester Met University and is a tutor for the Norwich Writers' Centre. Her seventh book, The Mermaid of Black Conch, is out now. So welcome, Monique and Nikesh. Um, how great it is to have two writers here who defy the old adage that there are those who do and those who teach because these two very prolific writers are also tutors of creative writing. So the focus in our discussion is around that and the intersection of those two practices. We're going to focus on creative writing as both of you teach it, but before the teacher obviously comes the writer. So I'd like you to talk about yourselves as writers first, about the new books you have underway or out and perhaps in the context of what kinds of writers you are and how that writing has any bearing on how you are as teachers of creative writing. So can we start with Monique? Oh. <laughs> um, gosh. Uh, yes, so uh, I, I'm, I'm actually, um, yes, I've written a lot of books somehow along the way. And it surprises me that I've written a lot of books. Um, so I think once you have written a, a few books, you can then look back and, and have a, a ready answer to this question of what kind of writer you are. Because I prepared this, I prepared this, what kind of writer I am. And thank God I've written a few books. So I, uh, what kind of writer, if I had to describe what kind of writer I am, I think what shows up for me is um, I do lean into myth, myth a lot and archetypes and um, they pop up in almost every book. Every book I've written has got some strong old story in it. Um, and part of, I don't know why I've always been drawn to old stories and archetypes, but um, I've also had a very long uh, stint in psychoanalysis years ago where I was recording my dreams and talking a lot about um, uh, archetypes and old stories and so what kind of writer I am is someone who 21st century rewrites old pre-feminist uh, tales that's certainly true for the mermaid of black conch which is all about female jealousy and intersectionality and uh, division between women and uh, so, yeah, I'm drawn to old stories again and again. And weirdly, um, magical realism seems to be something that turns up a lot. Um, I'm conscious that you had a, the question was really long. So I'm just going to answer the first bit and then go over to Nikesh. 
Great, Nikesh, um, it, it was a long question, you're right. Um, I guess the question is trying to combine two things. We'll get to the second part. Maybe you yeah. can just talk about yourself as a writer, what you're, what you're working on, what's coming out, what you're, what, you know, who you are, um, plug your books, please. Um, and, and, and we'll go on to the rest of the creative writing stuff. Yeah, so, um, what sort of writer? I don't, I have no idea what type of writer I am. I guess I, um, I grew up watching a lot of comedy and I've always wanted to make people laugh and I didn't have the guts to be a stand-up comedian and um, and I think fiction for me has always been a, a place to kind of ask big questions of like to look within and to look externally as well and to ask big questions and I think I think a lot of my work tends to look at what is happening now like I, I guess I guess I'm a contemporary writer, contemporary fiction writer. Um, I do re don't really like sort of labels like literary fiction because I don't really know what it is. Um, and I mean, for me, literary fiction, if someone asked me what is literary fiction, I'd say it's um, books where it's books where a creative writing, uh, white middle class creative writing professor has sex with one of his students and then is sad for 300 pages. Um, but. <laughs> I've only read that once and it won the book and I was just like, no thanks. <laughs> no, um, that's, that's all right. Um, but when I, so my last, so I, cause I write for teenagers as well as uh, for adults. So my last uh, two books uh, for teenagers, cause I, I spend a lot of time as a youth worker. What, the first one was sort of a contemporary thriller about gentrification. And the second one was um, about the trauma of a racist, racist attack set against um, set, um against the sort of the landscape of a boxing match and the thing that i've kind of got coming out next it was supposed to be out in february this year but it's coming out and sorry no it was coming um, is that the thing of zoom meetings where you kind of just i like, know <laughs> just settle into your rhythm um yeah i had a, i have a memoir coming out uh february next year it was supposed to come out in september called brown baby uh, a memoir of race family and home which is kind of it's sort of part parenting memoir, part grief memoir, and it's basically like about conversations I've had with my daughter about various um, various things and how how to how to raise children in a world that is um, witnessing the resurgence of or the reemergence of um, of the far right um, in the misogynistic world in a in a homophobic and transphobic world in a world that is. At, risk of climate catastrophe and how, how how I have those conversations with her that I don't lie to her and I kind of keep myself honest but at the same time raise her to feel to feel some semblance of joy and hope and optimism about what lies ahead um so that's coming out next year so those are the kind of the things that I'm talking about so I guess yeah I'm a contemporary writer I'm I'm very concerned with what's happening now and I think a lot of the stuff that I read and really engage with um tends to be quite political stuff I'm quite politically motivated and quite politically minded I mean who isn't <laughs> at the moment um mm -hmm. but it, it just it finds its way into my work great uh thanks um thanks both and I guess that does you know that does lead me to the question of the where does how does the writer bring him or herself into the teaching of creative writing because you said you know you're a political um, writer, writers, or you know, dealing with myth, and um, so does the does who you are as a writer affect who you are as a teacher? Obviously, it does. I guess what I'm asking is, how does it, and and how do you bring that self into the classroom as well as, you know, keep all those other writers held in their worlds, um, in their own individual worlds? Do do you have a a sense of how that works, how the magic works in the classroom? I'll, I'll ask Monique. Um, well, as Nick has just said, um, who isn't political these days? So I tend to find myself in uh, my class. Um, my classrooms seem to be, you know, politically engaged, young, usually young um, writers who I, I try not, actually, I try not to. I read a lot of Caribbean fiction and poetry. I mean, I would say sort of 80% of what I read comes out of the Caribbean region, contemporary Caribbean poetry, nonfiction, and British fiction, and you know, I'm reading everything all the time. But I feel as though, because I've got such strong 
uh, leaning towards uh, black writing, Caribbean writing, all, you know, experimental. I have got such strong tastes that I do try to ease off, off that. I kind of want to tease out what they're reading because I'm always absolutely gobsmacked by what young people or new emerging writers currently like, you know, steampunk fiction and, you know, they're teaching me. So I find it very interactive. Um, I mean, I, yeah, there's lots to say about politics in the classroom as well. Mm. And, you know, you mentioned something about the, uh, is there such thing as a, there's the patriarchal gaze come into the classroom. Yeah, Def we can, definitely, we can. definitely it does. Um, I, I, I do, I, I guess my experience, I'm a woman, so I guess over the years, I'm going to say, I've been teaching for at least a dozen years, I see definitely a, de a gendered aspect to um, the whole creative writing endeavour. Um, in terms of entitlement, I, I just again and again come across women, young women and middle, all kinds of women, who are... Um, just less less able to nail it to say you know to write strong female protagonists full of agency and who are on it and um i do see a lot of that i see it in one-to-one -one tutorials i see it in the classroom i see a gendered issue going on a lot um with the with the men finding the whole idea of publication just sort of trips off their tongue and, and, and it's just like, I will be published tomorrow. I'm, ama I'm amazing, I'm the next, I'm the next, you know, I'm the next whoever. I, f I find, you know, that there's a gender, women still feel much more, still much more cautious around whether or not their work is of any value, um, whether or they're doing the right thing. Um, I'm sorry, I, that, that is my experience over a dozen years. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Nikesh? Yeah, no. just to kind of link it back to the last question, um, uh, I, I often think that the, the characters who I'm putting on the page, I'm putting them on the page because they don't exist in what we may call like the British canon of literature. And, you know, there's obviously a conversation that we could all have about what that looks for writers of colour and um, how we you know how we have to kind of push for our characters to feel not just the asian character you know um and and you know i've never i've never studied creative writing i never didn't do an um uh, an english degree i did law because that's what my my dad want, wanted and um but because I spent so long as a youth worker, I was a youth worker for about five, six years uh, working on a project um, in Bristol where I was mentoring young writers to um, create content for a magazine and um, create video content and editorial content. And I was, I was basically nurturing them to find their voices. And I, and I kind of found that actually the way to do that was to kind of lean into the fact that I... I, I hadn't ever done a creative writing degree or I hadn't ever studied um, it, it formally, but, you know, I had have the thing that all of these young writers lacked, which was experience. And experience, it took me a while to kind of realise that experience counts for so much. You know, so much of what I know is was instinctual um, because I, I read as much as, I read more than I write. I absorb a lot of storytelling, whether it's um, through comics or film and TV or books or rap or, you know, what have you. And, and I just found that actually a lot of the writers I was working with, they just, they just needed help finding their voice and finding what they wanted to say. And all I could do was, like any good life coach, just ask them the right questions, just be really reflective and be really present with what they needed. And, you know, I, I worked with a lot of writers at the time. So I mentored Liv Little and Antonio Delami when they were setting up Galdem. And they were in their final year of university at, at Bristol. And I kind of helped them to kind of set it up. And then, you know, a bunch of the writers that I worked with, have, you know, all gone on to really, really amazing things. And that's been really, really great to watch. And it, it just, I think, I think what... I then realized when I sort of started to do it a bit more formally, like I, I, um, I started teaching on the Faber Academy course this year, the how to write a novel course. And I kind of had to formalize all of my, my thinking. Um, and the thing that I found was, I, I found that a lot of the, the books on how to write novels 
and how to write, um, they all kind of supposed that there was a formula. And all, all the ones that I read, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I have since discovered that there are some really good ones that kind of do the work around helping you to find, find your voice. And, and I kind of really sort of balked at this idea that there was a formula that kind of would potentially take us away from the thing that we wanted to, to say or, or and actually the thing that a lot of writers needed help with was just feeling confidence that, that their story was worth telling and then how that and then once they had confidence in the story that they wanted to tell then we could help them to tell it in the best way that they could tell it and so and I, but I think all of that's just come from um, running this youth project and m like mentoring and like you know doing mentoring training and life coaching training and, and using that um, in the classroom as well as like all of the more formalized teaching. Great, you've, you've really um, kind of got into my question that, um, that the, it's the really the most annoying question that I think there is around creative writing is can you teach creative writing? I get really annoyed because it's like asking, it's like asking people, can you teach dance or can you teach painting? And so uh, we'll kind of get rid, uh, rid of that question as a question because um, I, but, but I think that there are, um, there is something else around that question that is really about um, a political or structural or entitlement or privilege mm. that, is, uh, that does kind of get into um, can you teach it or where that question comes from. It already says a lot about, you know, um, the entitlement of that, of, of, of creative writing as a, as a course. So I wonder if you could, could address that, you know, what do you say when people mm. uh, uh, when they ask that question, can you teach creative writing? Um, well, actually, um, I get that question. I just was I just was recorded something for a radio program yesterday, and I was asked that question. That was like, so as if it was a current. You know, I know it's like a question we should all just go, just stop it, stop it, <laughs> stop asking it. It's over. <laughs> but I just got asked it yesterday. Um, so I'm going to put my cards on the table. I used to be a center director for the Arvon Foundation. And um, so that was an amazingly formative experience for me. And I was a really young writer. I'd only written, I was like just out of, I was writing my first novel. So it was a long time ago. I think um, the Arvon experience for me has completely made me as a teacher because it was the generosity of these poets. Um, 40 years ago who um, stumbled across uh, some children being taught, I don't know, something by rote, some big long poem by rote. And they basically said to the teacher, this isn't the way to teach children poetry. Um, can we please have them for a week and we're going to teach them poetry. Of course, today that would never be allowed, be you know, completely unethical to, to take kids off to a haunted house and, and put them in a ditch and get them writing. But so I was really privileged to meet the founders of Arvon. Um, I mean, you know, so privileged. I just, you know, I kind of owe everything to, to them. Um, and so I spent four years in the background, you know, washing up and facilitating and programming and blah, 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 blah. But I got to know so many um, writers in that time. And I got to witness, I mean, just what Nikesh is talking about. The, um, I think there's something amazing in this country. I come from a country, I come from the West Indies, Trinidad, where there's no art provision for nobody ever, nothing, nothing going on really. And so here we are a developed country and I was meeting um, lineages of poets. I was meeting um, somebody who'd mentored, um, you know, Neil Rollinson. And I was meeting all these poets and happens more in the poetry world, I think who had been mentored by other poets and who were coming to mentor a whole new generation of poets. And it was like a, it was literally, you could see this happening week after week after week. It was so impressive. Um, it really fueled, I mean, I'm a passionate teacher. I, I always refer to myself as a writer teacher because of those four years at Arvon. I also have done an MA in creative writing and a PhD in creative writing. And I've done every single, you name it, it, I've done the class because I was such a nerd when I was, you know, trying to be a writer myself. And so um, I, I, I can't remember what you've asked me now, but something <laughs> about the fact, what, what was the question? Can you, when you, what do you answer when people ask you, can you teach? Oh, yes. Oh my God, it's been taught. It's been 
it's been taught for 40, uh, 40 years, the last, the last half of the 20th century. And um, craft underpins uh, novels. Um, so Blake Friedman and my agents and Carol Blake died uh, a couple of years ago. And she said she always laughed when someone said to her, oh, before I die, I'll just write that novel. And she said it was so arrogant. It was like saying, oh, before I die, I'll just do some brain surgery. Um, there's a lot to learn. There is a lot to learn. I really agree with Nikesh. It's like finding, it's like pushing these fledgling ducklings out of the nest and saying, fly, you know, you're going to fly. It's going to be cool. But there are, there is stuff to learn. Definitely stuff to learn. Yeah. Yes. Nikesh, what do you say when people say, and people ask that question or they say that they, that you can't teach? Well, I just wanted to tag on to what Monique was saying, because I think, I think the the one thing that is consistent with all of the writers that I've I've worked with, um, be it through Arvon or through at Bath Spa or at, on the Faber Academy or or at Rife Magazine, and I think it's it's um, I think it people don't I think people assume as as you were saying people I think people assume it's a lot easier than it than it, it actually is, and and I guess the thing that I often try and try and do when I'm teaching is um, get people to think about story before they think about craft because the craft is the craft is the stuff that you can learn but the stories that you want to tell are is the much more unknowable unquantifiable intangible thing it's the kind of like I, I don't know like the sourdough starter spongy beautifulness of of writing because everything starts with that story and and you know and I often turn to like to screenwriting advice because I feel like screenwriters have this real uh, especially American screenwriters have this real sort of bottom line way of like interrogating writing and um I really I, re I really like how um when you're working on scripts you know, producers and other writers will always, that you know, they'll, they'll kind of always put to, put to one side what's actually happening in the scene. And they'll just go, you know, what, it, what is it really about? And, um, and I, think, I think the switch for me that kind of made me realize that I can do this and I, I should take more, have more confidence in what I'm doing um, and I can teach it was just this sort of realization that actually what, ha what happens could be anything. Anything could happen in a, in a novel. A novel could be about a meteorite hurtling towards Earth and it's going to hit Earth on page 120. Or it could be about two people falling in and out of love for 20 years, which, you know, where normal people is going to have been broadcast by the time people are watching this on, um, on Monday. Or it could be about anything. But actually, the thing that bring draws people in is what it's really about and i really appreciate screenwriters for for just that simple simple nugget you know of just really getting writers to know what is it really about because i think writers often get so hung up on the construct on on what is happening on the page and they never actually stop to think well what, what does any of this mean for the characters mm -hmm. Yeah, and you both do um, different genres. You both do fiction, non-fiction, and, and Nikesh, you do um, screenplays. Um, and, and I guess you've answered my, one of my questions, which is how do you deal with different forms in, a, in say, a classroom of people with different abilities and different, um, uh, different ideas and different genres that they want to deal with? But I guess that also leads me to the question about, um, you know, other than one-to-one -one tuition um, and feedback that, that you give to a, a person, you know, the main sort of uh, method in creative writing is the workshop. And um, the workshop is, you know, I wonder what you think about the workshop and what's, what are its strengths and what, what are its weaknesses? What can it do and what works and what doesn't work and why? Is there, is there a reason why it's it's ideal or not ideal as a as a form i i i i, I do like workshopping but i can kind of see its weaknesses i think the strength of the workshop is it teaches you how to critically evaluate your own work yeah uh, it teaches you critical skills that you just you just don't have and that's going to help you when you're editing that's going to help you think about big picture stuff rather than moving commas around the thing that the the atmosphere i always try to create with workshops is I spend a lot of time 
in the beginning instructing writers that they're not in competition with each other no one is no one is here to kind of steal publishing deals from other people everyone is here for their own for their own novel you know you're not competing with anyone else and actually the thing the skill the takeaway from this that you're going to you're going to get is that you're going to learn how to critically evaluate your own work uh, also you're going to have a lot of people feeding into your feeding into your work and um the more confident writers and this is a process and you will get more confident as it, as we go but the more confident writers will start to pick and choose what they decide to take with them out of the classroom you know the more confident writers will, will listen and thank people for their feedback and go well a b and c i'm not i'm not going to worry about because you know i've got that covered elsewhere they're only reading a small chunk of the, of the novel um but d that they said that some that there's something interesting there maybe i just haven't executed it in the way i thought i had and you know maybe that needs more looking at and and i think and, and i've seen workshops really sort of have this sort of interesting like thing with people i think the first time people have their stuff workshopped it completely um freezes them and they think everything they're doing is terrible and what's the point and why did i pay x amount of money to do this and why am i spending all this time i could just be a quantity surveyor uh, <laughs> but um but like by the t by the third or fourth time they're, they're so much more used to it and they're so much more bulletproof but also because they are into the novel they know the answers they always know the right answer and yeah. all we can do is help them find the right answer and so like we always frame it like i'm not interested in people saying what is terrible about this piece of writing and so I always say, um, I want you to tell, tell, tell us what's working and tell us what could be better. And that's all we're interested mm. in. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo what Nikesh has just said. I think it's a really safe environment where people's awareness shifts. Um, a, a lot of people who uh, you know, are really new to writing, want to write, I often hear they're sort of, I don't know if it's any good. I don't know if it's any good. And it's crucial to be able to evaluate your own work over time. It is crucial. It's a different, it's like a tennis player. Good tennis players can use, but can hit the ball with both hands, can't they? And I always say it's like, it's a, it's a slower skill to master, but over time you will be able to, to edit your own work. And it starts in the workshop by listening to, um, I mean, you know, feedback needs to be constructive, not destructive. You don't want it to just be destroying people in class. And I always say, you know, it's not helpful to say, I don't like this. Um, what's helpful is, is, uh, is why, you know, what isn't working, what's working, what isn't working. So in, in a, and, you know, in a, in a workshop, people start to um, learn the language of craft, learn the language of feedback, understand how to give um, really helpful feedback, understand how to take it. I do, I do have one rule, which is I always say, if it's your turn to receive, um, that you aren't, you just have to sit there and, and hear and hear it. Um, because there's this great inclination to defend your work or to explain your work or to, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. And that's for later. I sort of say, just, just hear um, how your work has landed, how, you know, hear how your work has been received. And um, because that's such a valuable gift. And I also think um, that if you attend workshops, I think within like three months, you'll, you accelerate. You just learn so much really quickly by attending, not just having your work um, uh, workshopped, but other people, you learn so much from hearing uh, uh, other people's work. And I think, um, yeah, there's this idea in the past pre-creative writing workshops where there would be a writer uh, trying to write his novel. Usually it would be a, ma a man because in the past, you know, so many people didn't write, including, you know, women. So there'd be a man writing and he'd be writing the novel and he would show nobody and get no feedback and um, maybe show somebody who liked him and then send that book off to an agent and it would be rejected 45 times and then he would get really bitter and start drinking and that would go on for 10 years, you know? And, and I know writers who, I know people who are like, I never got published. I'm like, well, did you ever go to a workshop? No, they're not for me. You know, Arvon, you would see uh, 16, 16 participants. You'd see three men in 16. And that was like week after week. And so, 
you know, there's this thing about getting the oxygen of critical feedback in a safe environment, constructive environment from a group of peers, people who are on the same page. Yes, mixed ability, there'll always be the two or three shit hot, shit hot people in the group, but you're all starting together. So there's, you know, um, I think it's, I'm a real, real believer in uh, go get thee to a workshop. Let me just play devil's advocate for a second then to ask you, um, or did, sorry, Nikesh, did you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt us. I, just because uh, Monique said a really interesting thing and it just made me think that, I think that sometimes um, it's always the first few workshops that tend to be the, the most uneasy. And then once you're into it, um everyone starts having the same sorts of problems and so you kind of get yeah. you kind of get to a really nice point probably about halfway through where you can be like okay so next week when we're workshopping stuff we're just going to focus on dialogue we're just going to focus on setting we're just going to focus on this because actually i think reading chunks of novel in isolation and it may be the same chunk or it may be a chunk near the beginning a chunk near the middle and then back to near the beginning again and you're never reading it sequentially and so you're often going to have story questions that actually the author doesn't need help on the story questions because they've kind of got it all up here so it allows you to kind of I, I, I quite like it when we get to the point where workshopping is much more discussive and it's actually less about the person whose work is being discussed and more about the com commonality between everyone, everyone's problems because we all have the same issues we always need <laughs> dialogue punching up we always need working on setting we always need x y and z so um i really like that part of it that's a, that's an interesting point that you're actually in the workshop you're you're really dealing with process for everybody rather than specifics and content which is what you, you were saying before but if i were to be devil's advocate about the um about the 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 people who criticize you know the, the 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 book written through the mfa for example and who who say that workshopping is um, writing by consensus and it tends to flatten out because everybody has to agree well, how would you how would you respond to that monique oh you know um, so in my groups at man met um, we do put all the genre writers in with the literary writers. So you'll have fantasy, horror, vampire novels, um, steampunk, and anything, all kinds of stuff. And then you'll have the people who are, you know, writing, you know, literature and writing something less, you know, genre based. And all kinds of stuff comes out. And I think um, it's, an, it's a creative writing space, creative it's it's it and the creativity is in is present in the room um so it I, mean, I could lose i could lose my job if i if i heard the real thing and i i i kind of try to snuff it out that you hear the real thing all the time in creative writing workshops yeah and i think what you're saying is that it's actually um it's not by it's 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 actually more than the sum of the parts in that in that it's not just by it's not that critique is not about the writing by consensus it's that you're challenged to go beyond the consensus and that the, the criticism and the consensus is something that uh creates a, a, a different kind of writing yeah yeah i i think that um I definitely think um, what we're trying to get a consensus on isn't story, isn't plot, isn't um, attitude, isn't being contemporary or being fashionable. We're not trying to get a consensus on what kind of novel you should write to please uh, the, the please the current zeitgeist. We're not trying to get a consensus on what I always say. I'm I'm the dog, and the industry is the tail you're the dog you know i say you're the you're you're the gold you're the hot stuff don't try to please anyone and when what we're, i'm trying to get a consensus on is um you know should that full stop go there or not you know mm -hmm. are you you know do you know what a full stop is you know do you know how, how to use a semicolon that needs consensus people need to know how to you know bloody write you know they need to know what language is so that's that's the stuff that i think really needs to be you know like i'm I want you to write a really great sentence. I don't care if you're trying to write the next um, Normal People by Sally Rooney, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Nikesh, did you want to come in on that? 
yeah, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. Um, Please. <laughs> because, you know, I, I have been critical of creative writing degrees in the past. And I think, and I think I, I've refined my critique um, the more I've kind of engaged with um, teaching creative writing. And I think what, I think what I actually dislike is I, I think for um, there, there is a, there is a, a, a privilege issue with, you know, being able to do a creative writing at MA, um, you know, where it's finances and the, the time in your life to be able to do it, that kind of attracts a certain type of person. And, but I think that the critique that I have about um, creative writing at MAs isn't necessarily how they're taught. It's actually who agents choose to pick up off them. And I think that that's, that's really the issue that I've had because I always, until I started engaging with creative writing courses, I just assumed that every, everyone who was doing creative writing MA was just writing a, a normal people-esque novels. And, and it was actually when I started um, sort of te teaching on them and like um, doing guest guest spots and um, and you know workshopping all the rest of it I realized that people are writing so many different things but then just made me think well why aren't agents picking them up why aren't, aren't agents picking up more genre stuff out of creative writing MAs why are those genre things kind of coming through um, different you know different platforms that that nurture um, people who are writing sci-fi or fantasy why you know if they are doing those creative writing MAs why aren't they getting picked up and so I, I kind of I kind of think that, that the stereotype of the type of creative writing um, student who then gets published has become like a self-perpetuating stereotype. And actually, like in reality, when you kind of see what's going on on the ground, it's not actually very accurate in terms of the students who are there. But it just makes me wonder why though, why agents are only picking up a certain type. I, but then that's that's me kind of mouthing off based on my very limited experience of teaching it. So, Monique, please complete. Well, no, I'm, I'm interested. I can I hear you. I'm taking that in and um, being somebody who is you know both teachers on an MA and did one. I I teach up north, so um, oh my god! I mean, you oh, it's just got so much to say about this. Um, yes, I mean, when I did my MA, I paid for it myself. I took out a loan and paid it off. Um, there are ways, I mean, I don't necessarily consider myself somebody who had lo loads of money in the bank to, to, to pay for this. I definitely think it's a huge expenditure. It's a massive investment. And, you know, we have to ask whether or not every single person, because it's like an industry now, who does an MA, you know, are they capable of, of publishing a novel, let alone sell it, you know, are they capable of writing a publishable novel at the end of their MA? I think uh, we throw a lot at them. They definitely come out different. Different. I mean, we, in my classes, we see tons of genre, tons. I, and I've, I've had this thing with, with younger people. I'm like, they've seen so much stuff on the internet. They were thinking about this pandemic all their lives. They've seen so much war so much sci-fi they're just writing these kind of apocalyptic dystopian wild fantasy epics and i'm like you're from you know you're from preston you're from round here what's wrong with your neighborhood oh it's boring i'm like do you know how little actually you know northern literature do you know how little stuff is you know i can think of one and he's actually a member of staff um andrew hurley who's from um where's he from morecambe or somewhere i can't think of too many um amazing contemporary writers coming out of the North. In my classes, they all want to write um, the end of the world scenario. In fact, I've been in class, I've taught classes where like not just one, but two or three of the students are writing the end of the world. And I'm like, if I were you, and I was in a class where other people were writing the same story, I'd, be, I'd, I'd think about that. They're not thinking about it. So I think um, there's creativity all over the place. But I, I do hear you, um, Nikesh, I do hear you. Well, yeah. Both of you, sorry. It, sorry, I was just going to say, I, I think it's often, it's, it's a self-perpetuating stereotype of London and the um, <clears throat> and UEA prob probably kind of make up for a lot of that stereotype. Um, but 
and, and you're right i think there's there's so much to be said for what's happening regionally that that really needs to be addressed in in the publishing industry like you know when we when we set up um the good literary agency um we were really adamant that we didn't have a base uh, we didn't have our hq in london we, we we were based in bristol where i live because we want to just sort of send a message out that we're not just looking for writers who are in london and can afford that sort of london bubble mm. one thing that you've both led me to in this discussion is this um the idea around decolonizing the curriculum decolonizing the classroom the discipline the industry and i must say at uea we are doing a lot of decolonizing we're leading the way in decolonizing but i just what you're what you're saying um about what you do as individuals in the classroom sounds like it is very much with that consciousness in mind and i just wonder if that is so that so that when you're in the classroom or when you're with students are you conscious that you're pushing the industry towards something else that you want to see in terms of the people that you want to read you've kind of answered that but do you have more to to say on the decolonizing issue well i, I uh, you, you go nikesh sorry um i i i do i i i teach not just creative writing but i teach um a module called reading novels one and um so we look at the late 20th century novels and um so i have been very active in decolonizing that um to get more people of color more you know on the reading list um but in terms of creative writing um yeah uh how many people of color do i see in my creative writing classes yeah m much less much less you know maybe one person in the classroom maybe two um that's also true for sort of lgbt yeah the the classroom is um homogenous um i i saw something once um it's a it's a facebook thing that's gone around it's a big meme and it was a white professor and she was um bawling out another white a white student about um race and it's really riveting to see this white woman, you know, like really calling out another white, young white girl. And um, I, I find, I find I can't, I mean, I, you know, this, this young student was crying, you know, and I've been in situations where there's definitely a need to talk about cultural appropriation. There's definitely a need to talk about issues where someone's writing about people they don't know about and and i i find it's 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 a topic where you know if i'm not really careful i'm going to have a student crying um you know if i'm not really careful and i don't want to make anyone cry i'm a teacher i'm supposed to be constructive so um it comes up a lot it does come up you know why are you writing about about kenya if you've only spent a year there and it was your gap year why are you writing what's what's what, what is it about kenya that you really need to write about so you know yeah all of this comes up yeah decolonization being very careful in fact my undergrads um they do a they do a module in cultural appropriation so it's nothing new to them and that's a good thing alexander chi wrote a really amazing essay about about writing the other that i always refer to um i'm not going to paraphrase it but um just look up Alexander Chi writing the other, and I'm sure you'll find it on the internet. Somewhere. Is that C H I? C H E E. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I always try to make sure that the books that I recommend or the books that I draw from um, when I'm sort of lecturing are not the sort of the the, the types of books that um, people might have or it already read uh, you know because I, I think it's important to kind of widen people's um reading palette as well you know when you're because i i think a lot about um i i once had a short story in a book slam anthology years and years ago and um in a review of the anthology uh, the reviewer said that um he'd found it hard to follow because of all the indian names and that really stayed with me because um they weren't all 
Indian names, but uh, but then he said it was nice to see Indians going through the universal experience as well. And that really stayed with me because it just sort of was a reminder that the universal experience isn't my experience. My experience is a, is an Asian experience. It's a South British South Asian experience. And that, that there's no universality there according to the canon. And so I think I've, I've kind of strived to present um, books, um, books by writers of color as default to, to kind of help, to help widen readers palettes. Um, Again, I'm going to paraphrase and butcher a quote by Zadie Smith. Please, I apologise for butchering this quote. But she said something like, I want to take words like black and women and stretch them until I feel comfortable enough to live inside them. I, something like that. And I, I really I really love that idea that, um, you know, when I think about myself as, you know, a British South Asian brown male, um, that, you know, the, and all the, all the stereotypes it kind of conjures and how, how they kind of manifest in the canon of what what we see on our screens and what we read what we have on our bookshelves um it's really important for me to kind of to to stretch to stretch that and when i'm when i'm teaching i feel like it's really important to sort of put that into the classroom as well and um as well as reading lists like i i i <laughs> really could probably made people upset with my um very <laughs> my views about um writing the other um but I, I often liken it to um you know if you were writing a police procedural drama you'd probably want to talk to a policeman or policewoman or police officer and make sure you got the procedure right because mm. there are a lot of people who are going to read it and they will pick you up um, and pick you up on it if you get the procedure wrong because they lap all they lap these books up. So if you're willing to do that research, why wouldn't you want to research people who are Yeah. Why wouldn't you want to just make sure you've got um people, other people right? And it, you know, there there is this sort of thing to, you know, and I'll hold my hand up because I, I am a male writer who has written some shockingly bad female characters. But um the thing that I remember when I was pulled up on these um bad female characters was uh, you know after the initial sting of going oh how how dare they say that about my work of genius um was actually going oh god I should learn from this because you know I want to be better you know uh, you know I, I I don't want to speak for either of you as writers but I certainly feel like my, myself as a writer I I am constantly emergent i'm constantly getting better at what i do i'm constantly finding new ways of better ways of telling the stories that i want to tell i'm constantly learning to be a better version of myself with each book and um and so and one of the only ways to kind of to get better is to sort of learn from those mistakes and so i th i often think that the worst thing a writer can do, in, be it in a workshop situation or be it when they write a really bad Gujarati character, is get defensive because that defensiveness kind of tells me that you think you know it all already. And so going back and to, to sort of circle the square one not, um, and go back to Tessa's original question of can you teach creative writing? Not to everyone. <laughs> there are some people. <laughs> I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah, great. I agree with that. I think the the question gets mixed up with can you teach talent, and can you teach yeah, patience? Yeah. Patience is a really big ingredient. Um, you have to wait a lot with writing, but um, but talent is like innate. So if you have a feel for language, and you are a storyteller innately, and you're bubbling up. You're going to get a lot out of a creative writing class. You you get you put uh, anybody who wants to write in front of Nikesh. You want someone like Nikesh or anybody who's like done it, doing it. I can do it. It's hard, but here, have a go. They're just going to grow. They're just going to like mushroom. And I think the sad thing is 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 that yeah, there's lots of people in creative writing classes who just don't have it, and it's fine. You know, over time, you know, yeah, there's. You can't, you can teach, you can, you can, even somebody who's shit hot needs to know what point of view is and, you know, how to control it and 
stay in third person if you're using third person, etc. But most people who are really talented, creative writing the class, it's like, you know, it's like just like lighting a, a touch, touch fire, you know, whatever it is. It's just like, whoosh, they're off. Great. Yeah. And the other thing that kind of, I think, goes hand in hand with talent, because, I, you know, sometimes I think talented people with who are quite vulnerable often fall at the first first or fourth or fifth hurdle the other the other thing that i try to instill in writers is that because all of this takes a long time you have to be persistent you have to you've got to be in it for the long haul you've got to teach yourself to be persistent and be able to um, spend years on the same novel because if you think you're going to write a novel in six months and that first draft have nailed it and you will get and uh, you know the the top agent at the top agency to represent you and then sell you sell your book for whatever amount of money is a decent amount of money in the at that time then that has never happened well i have to tell you i know somebody oh okay who <laughs> had, that's exactly what happened to her okay I tell and that's, that is the exact thing six months boom massive auction da, 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 da. It, occasionally it happens <laughs> yeah yeah but it's it's always the dudes who are like that's me you know if it happened to that one person <laughs> yeah okay um, i think go on. I, I think we're we're running out of time we're headed into our hour so i have one um other question that might roll into another question but here we are i have to acknowledge that here we are on lockdown here we all are as writers. How are you faring as writers on lockdown? But also, what in your, if you were to um, think of this as giving a creative writing uh, class moment, last word of how to deal with writing in lockdown, what would you say? Nikesh, let's start with you. Um, dance like no one's watching. Love like you've never been hurt before. Um, no, I mean, I'm, 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 but, um, I, th I think, I think a, a lot of us are struggling with um, the what does this mean question and, and what does this mean kind of invariably means, well, what does this mean for, for novels? You know, what is, a, what is a novel, you know, what is a novel in a post-pandemic um, universe look like? And, and, I, and I often think that the thing that hasn't changed is what makes us human. The thing that hasn't, isn't changing is who we are. And um, as, long as, the, as long as you're writing to that emotional truth, then just, just keep going, you know. The, the universal story of, you know, what your thing is really about what won't change. You know, how it happens on the page might change, and, but that's fine, you know, you can, can work on that um in the years between now and when it gets published and so i think a lot of writers are feeling like well i have this time so i should just bash out that novel that i've always wanted to bash out but actually that's the wrong way to think about it you know as we've all said you know these things take time and they take thought and they take years and years of living with a subject and living with a question and living with a bunch of characters before you're even ready to to commit them to to action or commit them to a place or a moment or a time and you don't have to write a novel you know if you want to stare out of a window holding mm -hmm. onto the browning half-eaten apple that you started eating an hour ago and feel depressed because you haven't seen your dad in four months that is okay if you want to make notes on starting a novel, that is okay. If you start writing a novel, unless you're one of the rare talents that Monique was talking about, um, <laughs> won't be ready by the time you by the time lockdown ends, and that's okay. You know, all all routes are valid. Hmm. Thank you. I'm going to take that advice, Nikesh. <laughs> um, Monique, what do you um, think? Yeah, I echo what he says. Um, we're just so, it's, this is unprecedented times. You know, if lockdown was a, was a literary genre, it would be magical realism. Because just, we just don't know what we're doing. Anything goes, anything goes. 
I, I, I think, you know, absolutely there's no rules. We, we, I mean, I think, you know, you, all three of us, I don't know about you, but I know people whose mothers just died um, in a home. I know somebody else whose mother's just died, not in a home, she just happened to die, but they can't have a funeral. I know someone whose brother's died. Um, I've got several friends who've had this thing. I'm high risk. I'm living in mortal fear daily of getting it. Um, I go on, I mean, I can't sleep. I, I, funnily enough, I've been trying to write this crime novel for the last, you know, year or so longer. And I bashed out, I bashed out a chunk actually in, in, over the last month. I got to about 30,000 words and I was thinking, mm, okay, Rafi, you know, you got all this time, you're writing, da, da 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 I sent it to a really good friend of mine who's an editor and she just got back to me and said, I think you need to start with a treatment. I think you've got to go back to the treatment stage. I mean, my, my attention is just shot. My, my attention span, I mean, I, I can't, you know, I've just got a headache all the time. And so I've just published a book, The Mermaid of Blank Conch. And, you know, oh my God, it's just a, it's a really difficult time. It's a really difficult time. So there are no rules. That's what, um, I think we're all, all our collective adrenaline just think about how what it's like to live um, day, daily, weekly, monthly now, the foreseeable future, with such amazing uncertainty. Um, there are no rules. There can't be any rules. I would just say, give yourself a big break, whatever you're doing. If you're in the middle of a, you're trying to finish a novel, you're trying to start a novel, whatever you're trying to do. I mean, I just think that, you know, whatever you do, it's okay. What about you, Tessa? Yeah. I'm similar to all of you. I haven't been able to do a thing. I've just been able to teach. I've been able to um, do all the admin stuff. I, have, I also have a book out in Canada at the moment that I'm supposed to be on um, book tour with. So I'm doing a lot of events like this. Um, in order to um, publicize that book and I, and it's um, it's exhausting it's it's a very difficult time and, and I don't know what to think about this time so I don't have any desire or any um, drive to write about it not yet it needs it needs percolation and and digestion and we need to really understand it thank you both so much um, for this the conversation. It was a really wonderful talk about yourselves as writers and about teachers as teachers. So um, I want to say thank you uh, to Monique Groffi and Nika Shukla and to everyone at home for joining Bookbound 2020 for this event. Um, there are lots of great events like this on our program. Search for Bookbound 2020 on Twitter and Instagram to learn more and help us spread the word using the hashtag Bookbound2020. If you'd like to buy the work of our authors, and please do, um, the links in the text below this video will take you through to Hive, an online bookseller which supports independent bookshops. Links to books discussed here and a discount code on selected festival titles are below. You'll also find our authors' favorite independent bookshops across the globe. You can also find the Just Giving link to donate to your, our chosen charity, Supporting Mental Health Mind, below. So thanks very much, everyone, and goodbye.